And uh, uh, so now it's, it, it's time to get down to some mathematics. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to now welcome Robert Bryant, one of the uh, pioneers of the theory of exceptional holonomy, who will be talking uh, about uh, a surprising elementary topic which is related to uh, questions in holonomy. His title is Rolling Surfaces and Exceptional Geometry. Robert? Hear me? I don't think it's on. Okay. Ah, now it's on. I, I can hear it now. Okay, very good. Oh, well, <clears throat> first let me say uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come back to, uh, to Stony Brook and to uh, particularly to the Simon Center for, uh, for uh, another, what has always been in the past, a great experience in geometry. And uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to uh, speak with you here today. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is uh, will ultimately be connected with exceptional geometry in a way and spin geometry and, uh, and, and a few other things. But it starts out with a very simple mechanical problem that, uh, that I want to describe and then, uh, and then explain how the, uh, how the story goes from there. The you know, classic problem in, uh, in what's called uh, uh, non-holonomic mechanics is uh, consider a, a ball rolling on a plane. So here's our plane, and there's a ball sitting. Uh, the configuration space of the ball is, of course, determined by where the point where it touches the plane and also how it's oriented. If you mark, say, a, uh, uh, if you mark a, a, whoops, oh, oh, sorry, Rob, uh, E2, this was a loner chalk, so, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I really, uh, and if you mark the, uh, say, an orthonormal frame on the ball, then uh, the, to tell you how it's oriented, then you can describe the rolling motion basically by once you once you prescribe how you're going to roll it, if you uh, the path along which you roll it, <coughs> if you here I'll I'll say the attitude matrix is the E1, E2, E3, uh, <coughs> uh, and uh, you can describe the uh, the motion as the, the constraint that we put is that we don't allow the ball to skid as we roll. That is, it shouldn't slip. And we also don't want the ball to twist. No, no twisting in the sense that we don't want it to... Imagine, for example, that the plane is coated with Velcro, and this is a, and this is a tennis ball. Uh, as it rolls, it's hard to twist it, and it's hard to make it slip. And the rolling constraint then tells us that, uh, that in fact, the DADT Turns out to be uh, turns out to be this expression uh, x prime a of t, <clears throat> uh, and this gives us a uh, this gives us a uh, a description of how the ball how the com how the uh, the configuration can move in this five-dimensional space, our M5, which is the, uh, the, the, the plane cross SO3. That's our five-manifold. And being a, being a geometer, a differential geometer, especially a disciple of, of churns, uh, we tend to uh, point out that it's not really dependent on the parameterization. It's really a statement about uh, about differentials that says that the uh, that says that what we're prescribing in uh, what this is giving us is sitting inside the tangent space to M5 uh, is a two plane at each point that's that's the two plane satisfied by these differential constraints uh, and so the rolling without twist no slipping or twisting that's what this condition says
I'll let you go home and check for yourself that this is what, it, this, that this is what the uh, constraint actually says. Uh, describes the, the possible paths that you can pass through the through configuration space M5 are exactly those tangent to this two-plane field on the manifold. And the question, of course, is, uh, is, for example, how can you control the ball if you want to if you want to roll to some particular place in some orientation? How do you know how to do that? In fact, can you do that? Uh, <coughs> And, uh, and how can you tell? Well, the, uh, uh, this is, of course, the, for, the, for the differential geometers in the audience, uh, this is, of course, a, a special case of a more general uh, phenomena. Uh, here, our P would be M. And we have a base manifold. Uh, and P is actually the, uh, the, I mean, M is actually the total space of some principal bundle G. And this, and this D, is telling you at each t at each uh, tangent space and configuration point in M, it's giving you a, a sort of a horizontal plane, transverse to the uh, transverse to the fibers that map down to the base point here, the R2. And so this uh, more generally, we could talk about uh, we could talk about curves tangent the the parallel curves of a of a connection. So generally. Uh, horizontal curves. Connection. <clears throat> but I'm not so interested in the actual, uh, you know, vibration down to the base as I am in understanding what the path space looks like in the manifold itself, in the, in the configuration space. Uh, and so I'm not going to concentrate on this. I'll just mention that that this is, uh, of course, a uh, very classically studied problem. It's called the holonomy problem of determining how you can, you know, if you look at what parallel transport can do in a bundle, how you can, uh, uh, which points can you, can you uh, actually reach. And uh, it, in this case of a, of a connection, it actually, uh, the set of points you can reach are the set of points that are, that are uh, uh, transformed from the point you start with by a subgroup of G called the holonomy group. But uh, in this particular case, I'm, like I said, much more interested in the, uh, in the question of, uh, of this two-plane bundle. And it belongs in a, in a sort of a more, general, uh, uh, a more general class of problems that is given a, uh, a k-plane distribution field d in some tangent space. Uh, and we and we ask when can two points uh, in M be joined by a curve tangent to D? Points of M be joined by a D curve, as we call it. That is a curve tangent to D. And this has a, has a very uh, classic answer. One case that you can see immediately that you couldn't do this is that uh, is if D, if this plane field happens to be uh, an integrable plane field, if uh, D is integrable, which can be tested by whether or not the bracket of any two sections uh, is also a section of D, then of course the then M is foliated by uh, by uh, leaves that are in fact tangent to D, and any curve that any curve that stays tangent to D lies in one of these leaves. M is foliated by D leaves, and and of course you can't get to. Any, you can't join any two points. You just have to. You can only join points that lie on the same leaf. On the other hand, if D is not integrable, uh, that is, if the bracket, if you can take brackets of things and, and generate uh, generate uh, more directions than just the directions you start with, then uh, then uh, what you'd like to know is how far can you go to get uh, whether or not you can answer this question of being able to get from any point to any other point. Uh, and so, uh, uh, otherwise, what we do, we take, uh, 
we define D1 to be, uh, sorry, I'll call it, yeah, D1 to be the uh, bracket of D with D and uh, DK plus 1 is the bracket of D with DK. And we look at this uh, sequence of, uh, we look at this sequence of spaces and the theorem, uh, the theorem of uh, Chow and Reshevsky is that, uh, is that if there is a K, if DK is TM for some K, then any two points, uh, assuming M is connected, uh, any two points uh, in M can be connected by a D curve. And in fact, in this particular case, uh, it's easy to actually check without too much trouble in our, in our rolling ball example the rolling ball, is that, uh, of course, the D bracket D turns out to have rank 3. That's D1. And uh, uh, a quick check then shows that D2, which is D, the, that's triple brackets of things in D, has rank 5. Which is, which is, of course, the whole guy. And so, uh, so in particular, that implies that, the, uh, that you can, in fact, join any two points in the, uh, uh, in the configuration space simply by rolling the ball in the right direction. It's not at all obvious how to do it, by the way. I mean, if you actually sit down and try to, try to figure out an algorithm, to, or, or, uh, or, for example, if you decide, if you want to look at, say, what's the shortest curve I can, I can pass along in order to roll from this point to this point and get in the right, uh, the right orientation, it turns, out that, uh, it turns out that the curves that you get are, uh, are the Euler elastica, the, the curves in the plane. You actually, they're integrated by theta functions. It's a highly non-trivial uh, uh, thing to determine. In fact, in, in fact, there's also a cut locus. There's a whole, you know, the whole subject of sub Ramanian geometry comes in. There's, a, there's quite a lot. Uh, of complicated phenomena to, to discuss in this, uh, uh, in even this simple thing of a ball rolling on the plane, if you want to actually find the most efficient way to say, have a robot pick up a, pick up a ball uh, and, uh, and by shifting the plates, roll it into the right orientation before you put it down. Uh, those are the kinds of things engineers worry about. And, uh, and in fact, uh, there's quite a lot written about even, even this problem just on the ball. Now, in fact, you don't even need to stick with, uh, stick with the ball. The, the obviously, uh, although, I, although I'm not going to write down the equations for it, uh, maybe, maybe a little later I'll, I will explain uh, uh, an easy way to do it. it you, you don't have to stick with the ball. Take any convex surface. You can, uh, you can ask how, can you, how, how would you roll it uh, into, into any given position. And, uh, and, you know, there's that natural question about what's the most efficient way to do it and so on. Uh, but, but the first, the, it turns out the first and most basic object about it, piece of geometry about it, is in fact this plane field. This, in each case, the configuration space is a five-dimensional space and you have, a, uh, and you have uh, basically two controls that you're basically, you can roll along the surface and you're choosing a curve in the plane, and you're navigating in a five-dimensional space. That's what, uh, you, that's what you're trying to figure out how to do. <clears throat> and, uh, and we want to understand what this constraint, what this rolling constraint looks like, and what it, what it is geometrically. Now, plane fields in general uh, is something that, uh, although, uh, although it, they obviously come up, come up a lot in differential geometry, uh, there, uh, we don't, uh, we don't actually study them that much in, uh, in great generality. Uh, we know a few cases, uh, simple cases, uh, of plane fields. 
For example, if you have a, uh, a two-plane field in three dimensions, uh, 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 so, uh, so uh, D2 and tangent of M3, uh, if it's not uh, D of dimension 2, I should say, uh, rank 2, if it's not integrable, then, uh, then it's a contact plane field. And you know, it has a local, uh, local structure locally uh, in the right coordinates, in so-called contact coordinates. It can be written as dy minus zdx equals 0. Uh, and you know, this, is the, this is if d bracket d isn't 0, uh, or d bracket d is not, uh, is not contained in d. That's the non-trivial case. The integrable case, of course, it's, uh, it's just going to be given as the level sets of a function. Uh, not, contained in D not contained in D at any point. It's a, sort of everywhere here. If it's, you know, at, or I should say this, if at some point this holds, then in the neighborhood of that point you can, you can write D in, in local coordinates like this, right? Uh, uh, obviously the rank one case is, we don't, we don't care much about it. I mean, it's just the line field, and obviously that's integrable, so there's not much to say there. Uh, so rank 2 and 3 is the first non-integrable non case that you could talk about. If you look at rank 2 in, uh, in uh, four manifolds, it turns out that there's, uh, it turns out that you can have the, uh, I, I should have given these numbers, given these things a, a name. If I let Ri be the rank Rix equals the rank of Di. <coughs> Uh, so, and so we have this sequence of, of numerical invariants, R0, R1, and so on like that. <clears throat> it's sometimes called the growth vector of D. If you look at, uh, if you look at for example, in a four manifold, if you look at uh, 2, 3, 4, which is the, which is the generic uh, distribution, the generic case, then, for example, you can always get uh, you can always get that it looks like this, dy minus zdx equals 0, dz minus wdx equals 0. Uh, this is, a, uh, this is uh, the Pfaff theorem. This is Engel, <coughs> the, the theorem that you can locally always choose coordinates to look like that. But when you get to dimension 5, something happens. Uh, again, rank two. If you look at two, uh, if you take two independent vector fields and bracket them, the most you can get is one more direction. So three is the is the is the natural thing that you can expect to expect to get for the next bracket. But then in five dimensions, what you can expect is if you take that extra vector field and bracket it with the previous two, then you could get two more, so that you could actually get up to five. And that is exactly what happens in this case. Uh, and what you might hope uh, is a uh, normal form here. Uh, <coughs> you might hope to find one, but in fact it turns out there's a very good reason there is no normal form, uh, or at least no simple normal form like this. And the reason is, uh, if you count it up, if you think about it like this, what is a two-plane field? So. You know, uh, uh, D is uh, locally, it's a section of this bundle of the Grassmannian of two planes and the tangent bundle, uh, M. <coughs> and let's just do the n dimensional case here. Uh, it's locally a section of the Grassmannian of two, plane, uh, two planes in TM. And the fiber here is, of course, the Grassmannian of two planes in Rn, and the fiber there has dimension 2 times n minus 2. So it's, uh, so it's 2 times n minus 2 uh, functions you're choosing of n variables locally. And uh, choices of coordinates, uh, local choices of coordinates are only n functions of n variables. So, uh, so 
it not, doesn't, take, uh, doesn't take too much uh, algebra to figure out that you're eventually going to run into trouble. Right? And sure enough, as soon as n gets up to 5, you have specifying a plane field takes six functions of five variables, but you only get five functions of five variables worth of choice of coordinates. And so, uh, so you can't expect to get, uh, get an invariant. It's sort of the, it, this is the crude counting, for example, that you, that you would use in, uh, use in uh, curves and surfaces course to convince people that there has to be some kind of invariant for metrics on surfaces. Because a metric on surfaces takes three components, the E, F, and G, and you only have two choices of coordinates locally, two functions of coordinates. So uh, there's got to be some excess, so there's got to be some invariant. And sure enough, there is in this case. <clears throat> but before we actually get to that, let me point out that, that this example actually turns out to, in some sense, not to be the most remarkable example that, uh, that, uh, that you can uh, run into in this case. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a theorem <coughs> that I want to mention. Uh, it goes back to uh, uh, 1893, Carton uh, and Engel, uh, independently, said that uh, if we consider on uh, uh, C5, or R5, the, uh, the uh, two-plane field, uh, the two-plane field D, uh, defined by, and here I have to get the indices right, I think, uh, and pardon me, I want to make sure that I don't tell a lie. It's, I never can, I, I never can remember this, but, uh, x2 minus x4 dx1 equals dx3 minus x2 dx1 equals dx5 minus x4 dx2 equals 0. So the vanishing of these three one forms, uh, which are clearly independent, uh, cuts out a, cuts out a two-plane field uh, on either C5 or R5, depending on whether the x's are real or complex. And uh, then uh, what they show is this, then the, the algebra of vector fields, the Lie algebra of vector fields, on, uh, on C5 or R5, uh, that preserve, whose flows preserve D, is uh, uh, G2C or uh, G2, uh, G22, the non-compact form of, of G2. I'm, I'm, being a, I'm cheating a little bit here because in the time that they, at the time that they wrote, this was 1893, they, 1893, they did not actually uh, uh, make a distinction between complex and real. There was, uh, they actually, uh, uh, they just wrote down the variables and, and, uh, and, said, and said it's G2. This is the first historical known example, uh, and, and it was actually the first complete proof that G2 existed, by the way. Uh, Killing had, showed, had shown that there was a root uh, system that, uh, that uh, existed, a rank 2 root system that could be constructed, but he hadn't actually verified the Jacobi identities. For the, for the algebra. So in, in fact, for the exceptional groups, he, uh, he did not do that verification in any of them. And, uh, and so it's kind of, uh, uh, it was, you know, in, that was in 1888. And so it was kind of a quest for, at that time, the young uh, hotshots uh, to, uh, to actually find the thing as a, as a transformation group. And this was what they found. Uh, that they actually show up in dimension five uh, this smallest of the exceptional groups shows up in dimension five, and uh, and in fact it does not show up in any lower dimension. There's no uh, there's no uh, 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 I mean G two does not act does not have any four dimensional homogeneous spaces, for example. 
Uh, this uh, Lie algebra of vector fields does act transitively on, the, on this space. It's, a, it's actually homogeneous. Whereas this particular one, the ball rolling on the plane, is not. Uh, it turns out that the symmetry group of this guy is actually the translations in R2 and the rotations in SO3. It's a, it's a much smaller group of transformations than this guy, which is, uh, which is 14 dimensional. Uh, anyway, you know, the, the, the problem of figuring out, uh, figuring out what the possible structures are, I mean, you can easily compute, by the way, if you actually just sit down with a, sit down with uh, uh, Maple or Mathematica, you can easily compute, for example, that the, that the Lie algebra of symmetries of this guy is only five-dimensional. Uh, but, uh, but, and with a little bit harder work, you can prove that the Lie algebra of this is 14-dimensional. Uh, but it's not immediately clear how to tell the difference. You know, if somebody walked in off the street with a, with a, uh, with a two-plane field and said, which one is it? Uh, it wouldn't be immediately clear how to tell that. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> in fact, you know, in, in the general picture, uh, as I said, I would, I would say, uh, you could you could consider a ball rolling, a one ball rolling, a, a one combat, one surface rolling over another. Well, generally, suppose uh, you have. Two surfaces, sigma one and sigma two, uh, and say with Ramanian metrics, g one, sigma two, g two. Uh, you know, here's one and here's the other. Uh, maybe I'll draw it hyperbolically. It's a, they don't have to have. Uh, in fact, you don't want them to have the same curvature. Uh, <coughs> the dimension of what? All of these surfaces. Yeah, the surfaces are, I'm going to assume they're both surfaces, two dimensional. Okay, they're, they're two dimensional surfaces. And I want to consider one rolling over the other without twisting or slipping. And the configuration space there is, again, a five manifold, if you think about it. So. Uh, you have the you have the uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the configuration space should tell you where the two surfaces touch each other, and it should also tell you the angle at which they at which they're touching each other. So there's actually a this is actually a circle bundle over over sigma one and sigma two, sigma one cross sigma two. It's a five manifold, and as long as the Gauss curvatures are distinct, if k one is not k two. Uh, then uh, the the distribution then uh, D has growth vector vector uh, two three five. So that's a you know there's a whole bunch of these surfaces there's a whole bunch of examples of this and if you're trying to you know if you're an engineer and you want to understand how to manipulate convex objects with a robot hand. Uh, one thing you might want to do is understand uh, understand the geometry of this uh, the geometry of this plane field. <coughs> now, fortunately, uh, the growth factor in the part. angle cases instead of two three four five. It's two three five. This is also two three five. Sorry, I should have said this is uh, two three five. <coughs> and. Uh, uh, and obviously, it has a huge amount of symmetry, um, you know, fourteen-dimensional symmetry, as opposed to sort of even in the case of the even in the case of the of the, uh, of the sphere rolling on the plane, you only get a five-dimensional symmetry. Well, fortunately, Carton returned to this problem, uh, and uh, and in 1910, and uh, and decided to work out. What the uh, you know how to tell when two five plane two plane distributions in dimension five were equivalent, uh, and uh, and he came up with a very beautiful answer. Uh, oh, I keep putting the eraser down in the place that I don't. came up with a really uh, beautiful answer. Uh, <coughs> it's a purely local question. That's right. Yeah. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, think about it, you know, it's a local question like how to tell when two surfaces are isometric. You know, the first thing you would check, I mean, we know to check that the first thing you would do is compute the Gauss curvature. And at least that has to match up. And then, uh, and then for further matching, you'd compute the, the, you know, the square length of the gradient of the Gauss curvature and make sure that those matched. And typically, that would be two, two independent functions on the two surfaces, and that would give you a unique possibility for matching them, because those functions would have to match. Right. That's the kind of thing that you might hope to be able to compute and tell whether or not two surfaces, abstract surfaces, were isometric. Right. So what Carton did was this. This is... And, uh, and although it seems like I'm... I'm I promise I'm not going to uh, continue linearly in time. Uh, we will accelerate, although I didn't start until 15 after. So, uh, so. Uh, Carton, 1910, he showed this, that if uh, D in T in 5 is a two-plane field with growth vector, vector uh, uh, 2, 3, 5, then uh, at, every point in the at every point, at every point, right? Yeah, uh, it's that's a generic condition, right? So uh, uh, and so I'm going to assume that it holds in the, on the whole thing. It's it's the equivalent for metrics of assuming the metrics non-degenerate. Right? Uh, then one, uh, the automorphism group of D is finite, uh, is a Lie group. of dimension uh, no more than 14. Uh, Would you say again what the automorphism group means? Uh, well, in this particular case, I'm, I'm going to take, I'm going to consider the diffeomorphisms of M that preserve D, that carry D into itself. No metric, nothing, we just preserve the plane field D. Uh, uh, and uh, and how do you tell them apart? What he uh, he proved that uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a tensor, uh, a tensor uh, uh, F, which he called F, which is a section of the fourth symmetric power of D star. In other words, it's a it's a quartic form on the plane field itself. It's a you know a, a, a differential form of degree symmetric differential form of degree four on the plane field, uh, F, that's preserved under all automorphisms and, in fact, is preserved under equivalences. Under equivalences. Uh, and there's no and there's no lower order invariant. I mean, there's no. Uh, I mean, this is this is the lowest order invariant. Sad to say, it turns out it's fifth order in D. Uh, fifth order in D. The analogous statement in Ramanian geometry is the Gauss curvature is second order in the metric. This actually, to, to compute it from D, raw D, you'd have to actually compute five derivatives. Uh, and third, that, uh, that uh, F identically zero, if and only if, D is locally equivalent to, to, uh, to uh, the carton angle plane field. So it actually, so this is actually the flat example in some sense. This example, in spite of the fact that it looks flatter or more homogeneous somehow, uh, is not the flattest thing. Yeah, so that's the interesting question. How did he actually take five derivatives? Because because it's because uh, it's you know the actual calculations. If you so what Carton did was exactly you know in some sense the exact analog of of what uh, of what uh, Levi Civita did in uh, in helping us understand what uh, Riemann had done. You know. Levi Civita figured out that there was a way to sort of co define a covariant differentiation 
and that the, and that the curvature of the Ramanian metric, given a metric, you could define a covariant differentiation in a natural way, and using that covariant differentiation, you could define curvature. So what Carton did was he figured out there's a natural way, given a D, to define a covariant differentiation. Uh, in fact, he, he developed, uh, it, you know, he, this is the, in some sense, the birth of the, of the whole idea of Carton connections. You know, projective connections, conformal connections, all those things are all, uh, as you'll see, uh, they're closely connected with this, but they're, they're all, once you've seen this, you can easily believe that you can make that work for anything. It, this, is a, this is a calculation of, of epic proportions in some ways. Yeah? So it's sort of clear, but I'm not entirely clear why this is actually an intrinsic problem. Could you? What do you mean, intrinsic problem? <coughs> oh, no. Well, you, uh, well, all you're using when you're, when you're rolling is uh, all you're using when you're rolling is the metrics on the two surfaces. The no slip condition is simply saying that the curves traced on the two surfaces are the same speed, okay. right? The no twist condition is saying that the curves traced on the surface have the same geodesic curvature. That's what it turns out to be. Right. So, uh, so it is. So it's purely intrinsic to the metrics on the on the surfaces. You can you could have uh, you know ignore the imagine that the surfaces are permeable except when they're tangent. So we're putting a metric on a uh, uh, sub metric on D equivalent to like choosing a margin for one of the two. Not really. No. Uh, I mean, putting a metric on D will allow you to just find the length of D curves, and that would definitely cut down on the on the number of automorphisms if you put that extra structure on there. Right. But we don't want to do that. Okay. I just want to look at I just want to look at the the, the control problem itself. You don't have any embedding at all. You just have no. There's no embedding anywhere. It's I mean, for you know, this picture of surfaces rolling over each other, and in, in fact, this is only a special case if you think about it, because. Uh, two surfaces, if you take two surfaces, remember they, metrics only depend on two functions of, uh, on functions of two variables, right? And so you've got basically, basically, you know, six functions of two variables. And, uh, and these things, as we already saw, even modulo diffeomorphism, they depend on one function of five variables. So there are lots of these things that don't come from rolling surfaces. In fact, it's an interesting question, how would you tell when they came from rolling surfaces? Or can you tell? Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so he, uh, so these are these are some of the roads. But but John asks a very good question. You know, how in the heck do you get to this tensor? And and the uh, and what Carton did was you know, he invented uh, you know a general theory of connections that allowed you know connections associated to any G structure, uh, and he applied it in this case and turned the crank and came up with this F. And, and, and that also, just as in the Levi-Civita case, it gives you the proof that there's no lower order invariance. So what that means in particular is that if you have a pair of these, uh, pair of these guys, uh, uh, say this pair of surfaces, that pair of surfaces, and you want to tell is the distribution the same, somehow or another you've got to go to at least uh, five derivatives of the d-plane, which it turns out, turns out to be, uh, turns out to be Six derivatives of the metrics. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a subtle problem. It's not going to be easy to you know it's not going to be easy to just eyeball it and tell what the tell whether or not the the things are the same. Um, uh, one more thing I, I, I want to mention is that he also determined uh, because he was interested in what are the homogeneous models. He also determined what all the homogeneous deep plane fields are. Uh, says op D is locally transitive on uh, on M uh, uh, only when uh, uh, op D has dimension fourteen, seven, six, or five. Those are the those are the possible homogeneous guys. The fourteen is only one of them, and that's when f is zero. Uh, the seven-dimensional case, uh, I'm not going to say much about it because geometrically it doesn't uh, uh, 
you, know, you can write it down. Uh, it turns out to be that the, the symmetry group is a, is a solvable Lie group. Uh, and uh, and it, it's interesting, but it's not, the, it's not the most interesting one. The most interesting one turned out to be uh, that he gave these examples of, uh, of something with six-dimensional symmetry. And he gave an actual geometric model that I, I want to describe. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Carton noticed that uh, so there are, there, are, uh, uh, there are homogeneous examples On uh, on SO4 mod a circle, this five manifold. Uh, this circle, by the way, is the circle uh, identity zero zero uh, C S minus S C. That circle. That if you look at uh, if you look at this five manifold, uh, he shows that he shows that there are homogeneous examples like this. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, and uh, they uh, and there's in fact there's a one parameter family of them. It's not too hard to imagine it when you when you think about it. He gave a nice geometric model, but there's a but there's a particular model that I want to that I want to mention. Uh, he didn't actually describe this, but but you can read off from his calculation the following thing. One obvious thing that would have more or less SO4 symmetry is if you take two balls, that is two spheres, uh, uh, that is one sphere rolling over the other. And, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, in fact, a one parameter family, and they are realized by, by uh, two uh, constant curvature. Uh, surfaces, uh, say with K1 and K2, different. different. Uh, uh, K1 and K2 both positive. So in that case, it might be helpful to think of it as SO3 times SO3 mod S1. Yes, that's right. In fact, in fact, you can see it over here if you think of if you think of the. You know, you're taking the, the, the frames of two surfaces and you're just matching the frames at a point, so you're dividing out by that circle action. So it's actually the two frame bundles of the surfaces divide by the circle action, and that's what you get. Uh, so that's two SO3s mod a circle, actually. Right. <clears throat> and, uh, and, uh, and it turns out that there was a special value of the parameter where f actually drops to zero. Uh, and so, and this has symmetry SO4, well actually SO3 cross SO3 as you say, except when, uh, when the ratio of K1 to K2 is uh, 1 to 9, or 9 to 1. That is, a sphere of radius 3 rolling over a sphere of radius 1. It turns out that the Carton tensor vanishes. And as a result, that actually is G2. The, the symmetry group of that object, if you forget about the metric and stuff like that, there is G2. Right. Yes? Why do you think K1 and K2 go positive? Uh, well, in fact, that's a good point. I, well, I was using Carton's uh, SO4. Uh, cross SO4, you know, basically the SO3 cross SO3 mod S1. But in fact, if you, you know, Carton doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily always keep track of whether he's using the co compact form or the non-compact form. Uh, if the ratio is, he only worked it out in the positive case. But if the if uh, K1 and K2 are both negative, and ratio one to nine, then that turns out that's also G2. So there's actually SL2R cross SL2R. Uh, so the plane is not, uh, the plane turns out to be, oh, I should have said, in that case, the symmetry group turns out to be SO3 times the isometry group of the plane. Sorry. And, uh, and yeah, in fact, I lied a few minutes ago when I said it was five-dimensional. It's actually six-dimensional because there's a rotation group of the plane, too. There's rotations of the plane. Right. There is actually a six-dimensional symmetry group there. But it's only six-dimensional. It's not, a, not anything larger. This was something... Yes? Is it possible to obtain something like a 
non-compact? This is the non-compact. Uh, these are always the non-compact case, right? Because, uh, because in fact, the compact G2 has no homogeneous spaces lower than dimension six. So the, the six sphere is its, is its best. Uh, what is the isotropy group in this five-dimensional? In this five-dimensional case, it's one of the two uh, nine-dimensional parabolics in 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 split G two. Uh, there are two non-conjugate parabolics depending on whether you go out on a long route or a short route, and uh, this is the one going out on the short route. Yes, yeah. the long route gives a different five-dimensional geometry that's not that doesn't preserve a plane field. So, which Carton also discusses in his, uh, in his thesis, actually. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, so, so uh, I observed this uh, some years ago, uh, but basically it's, it really is just an observation of what Carton's calculation was. Carton actually sat down and computed the, computed the, the tensor, this, this F tensor, and you should just translate his calculation over to, the, over to products of surfaces, and that's what you get, the ratio of one to nine. So the general yoga is that you get a, a, a connection on the G2 bundle relative to a part parabolic. Right, exactly. Right. And so, in fact, this is, the, this is the genesis of all this stuff about parabolic geometries. And this is the first fully worked out case of a parabolic geometry uh, that uh, it actually precedes the projective and, and uh, uh, conformal connections. It's 1910. Right. Uh, right. So, uh, so it's kind of a remarkable tour de force. It's a beautiful paper, uh, probably one of the most, uh, uh, you know, most inspiring papers I've ever read, actually. Uh, and I thought that I understood it uh, about as well as anybody for a long time. But then uh, Pavel Nurovsky noticed something that, uh, that was uh, very beautiful about this that, I, that never occurred to me. He was, he was coming to, at it from the point of view of, uh, of twister theory and looking at uh, geometry on moduli spaces of, uh, of, uh, of rational curves. And, uh, and he noticed that there, that, there is a, uh, that there's a way to interpret what Carton does in his calculation here, uh, in his calculation of this tensor, this construction of a connection and so forth, is that, uh, and this is, uh, 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 observe that, observe that, uh, that what Carton actually does is, uh, although he doesn't actually say this, if you look at his calculations, what he first shows is that there's actually, uh, that D determines a conformal structure on the five manifold. So, so a D as above gives a conformal structure. On, uh, on M5. The conformal structure actually depends on two derivatives of D, but you can actually, uh, 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 three derivatives of D. The conformal structure depends on three derivatives of D. Uh, I should, you know, defines a conformal structure. <clears throat> and of course, and it's a conformal structure in which D is a null plane. Uh, conformal structure of type, of split type, Two, three, uh, and D is a null plane in uh, in uh, for this conformal structure. Let's call this conformal structure G. Uh, <clears throat> and if you remember what happens in uh, in uh, conformal geometry uh, in split in split signature. In conformal geometry, the, the maximal null planes, which is the maximal, in this case, is two-dimensional, the maximal null planes correspond to the pure spinners, right? So there's actually, interestingly enough, if, so if you think of M5 uh, <coughs> with this conformal structure, and let's suppose for the moment that it's actually a spin manifold, uh, you can construct the spinner bundle over this, and uh, of course, CO32 is double covered by the conformal SP2R sitting inside uh, GL4R. 
And so this spin bundle is actually, uh, it, it's, uh, its fibers are four-dimensional symplectic vector spaces. And what, you know, the further interesting geometry that shows up is that, uh, so this choosing a null plane field turns out to be, uh, turns out to be equivalent to choosing a, uh, a line subbundle in here because in this dimension, uh, of course, all the, all the spinners are pure. So uh, any non-zero spinner determines a line field. And so, uh, and so uh, what that corresponds to is, is choosing a, a D corresponds to a, 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 a one-dimensional subbundle of the spin bundle of, uh, of M5. It's a symplectic group on R4. That's why I, that's, I tried to make it clear by writing GL4R. Right. And uh, it's the symplectic group times the scalars. Right. So, I mean, you know how the, you know, if you look at the symplectic group in R4, uh, the symplectic group preserves, the, preserves uh, a two form, a non degenerate two form. And the primitive two forms for that are a five-dimensional subspace. You know, there's two forms in dimension four. They're a five-dimensional subspace on which the, there's a natural inner product of signature two, three. And, uh, and that's exactly what's happening here. That's how you get this cover. Uh, the, conformal structure, the conformal structure just comes along as scalars. Uh, and it turns out that you actually get slightly more than the null plane field. Carton's, uh, if you read Carton carefully, you actually get uh, it turns out an actual section of this, of the conformal spin bundle. And uh, so, so the geometry of these five plane, this geometry of these uh, two plane fields in dimension five turns out to be the geometry of, uh, of split conformal five manifolds endowed with a, uh, a section of, this, of the conformal spin bundle. And the, uh, and they, it satisfies a natural differential equation. Of course, you don't quite have a connection. You only have a conformal connection, so you don't quite have a spinner connection, but you have a, you have a, a, a sort of conformal spinner connection. And this sigma satisfies a natural differential equation. And since this isn't for you know, a technical talk for geometry, I'm not going to actually write it down. But that differential equation is a, uh, you know, the existence of G uh, with such a section satisfying these differential equations is a, is a problem that shows up in studying the, uh, in studying the null infinity, uh, the conformal infinity of, uh, of uh, seven manifolds with signature 4-3 that, uh, that have holonomy G2, split G2, interestingly enough. <clears throat> now, uh, yeah, so so there's this kind of beautiful connection, uh, and what's what's really nice about it is that it turns out that this nonlinear equation, which prescribes this uh, cr prescribes these uh, metrics with uh, with a sort of conformally parallel spinner field, in this dimension turns out to be exactly equivalent to one of Carton's two, three, five plane fields. So in a sense, you know, uh, in a sense, Carton the geometry Carton wrote down is the solutions to this set of nonlinear nonlinear differential equations. Uh, it's just written, uh, you know, it's written as the generic things that do so and so. And the uh, and the other uh, beautiful thing uh, that Murawski observed is that in fact Carton's uh, Carton's tensor F is just the vial curvature of G. So, moreover. the vial curvature of G. It's restricted to the two-plane field D? Uh, well, actually, you, uh, it turns out uh, it is the entire vial curvature. I mean, you, you're, I, I know what you're thinking, that, that the vial curvature should have 84 components, not, uh, not 15. Is that, but it, the, the existence of this parallel spinner field kills a bunch of the components. And uh, this conformally parallel spinner field kills a bunch of the components. And in fact, it induces a, induces a filtration of the vial curvature bundle that, uh, so that everything lies in the small, in the small thing. And, and the only components that survive are Carton's, uh, are Carton's AF. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I 
actually, uh, there's, uh, I lied just a little bit. There's a sort of an augmentation of this, but it's, it's, it's completely determined by f. Everything's determined by f. So, uh, so the, uh, uh, this tie with conformal geometry in dimension 5 was very beautiful. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, and, and the fact that it's also tied with this, uh, with this uh, conformal infinity of G2 holonomy, uh, will split G2 holonomy 7 manifolds, is, uh, is really intriguing for a lot of us. We, uh, it gives us sort of a, you know, a hope for being able to generate uh, solutions to these, uh, to these other, these bigger nonlinear equations, or at least study their asymptotic properties in a way that we didn't, uh, we didn't have uh, available to us before. Um, yeah, now I'm about to run out of time, and I wanted to say, uh, tell you one more kind of remarkable thing that, uh, that uh, I mean, this, this completely surprised me. I'd never, I'd never imagined that you could interpret Carton's beautiful calculation in this nice way. And, uh, and uh, Pavel and, and, uh, and uh, Daniel, Daniel Ahn, Daniel, you're here somewhere? There he is, okay, right. Uh, have been, uh, have been uh, investigating this further, and, uh, and it occurred to them to ask, uh, ask uh, suppose you don't assume that, they're, uh, that you're dealing with two constant curvature surfaces. Let's look at these special cases of one surface rolling over another. Uh, in particular, let's look at the case of a surface rolling over a plane. And, uh, and uh, uh, Nirovsky and Ahn <clears throat> I guess, is this 2012? Is that right? 2012. <clears throat> uh, Nirovsky and Ahn showed the following thing, that if, uh, if sigma 1 is the plane and uh, sigma 2 is the surface, and here I'll make sure I get it right, uh, is the surface, actually it should be one of the surfaces, 9z squared minus 2 plus x squared plus y squared cubed equals 0. Uh, that's or the surface. 9z squared minus uh, x uh, minus 2 plus x squared plus y squared cubed equals 0. That's with their induced metric sitting in R3. Uh, then, uh, then the then the d then the d you get actually has f identically zero. And the way they got it was kind of by an ansatz. That is, they said suppose one of them is a plane and suppose the other is a surface of revolution. And uh, so that sort of cuts it down to one. Uh, basically one unknown, the profile curve of the other surface, and you get this absolutely horrendous set of differential equations. Uh, because you remember, you've got to differentiate five times to get where you're going, and, uh, and the unknown function, it, you know, it's highly nonlinear, you get these enormous polynomials in the derivatives, uh, but they were able to show that there was a solution, and in fact, uh, in fact, you can embed them in space in these ways. This surface, by the way, looks like a, looks it's kind of like a bullet shape like that. Uh, this surface actually is kind of singular. It, it's, uh, it looks like this. Has a, has a cusp right here. <coughs> uh, but, you know, just look at the convex part of it. Say, take one part of it off. And that rolling without slipping or twisting on the plane is also G2. And in, in, in some, some ways it's even more remarkable than the, than the, than the spheres rolling over spheres because you can't even see, uh, I mean the only symmetry you can really see is the four-dimensional symmetry that, uh, that comes from the rotation of, the sur of one surface and the, and the isometries of the plane. Uh, so it's, it starts with even let, and, and I would have, before I saw this, before they told me about this, I would have bet any amount of money that the only way you got uh, Carton, the carton angle distribution is in the, uh, is when it's one sphere rolling, you know, it's one constant curvature thing rolling over another. That's what I would have bet. You know, I, you know, it's hard to imagine that, that you could do this. 
Um, <laughs> if it's compact, right? Yeah. Is that, it's a compact surface on the flight. Uh, well, yeah, uh, well, I don't know now. So, and, and here's, uh, yeah, uh, let me tell you, let me tell you why. So this, this really intrigued me. So I decided I was going to just do the, do the actual, the actual bear out calculation uh, and of taking, you know, two surfaces, arbitrary curvatures, just looking at their covariant derivatives and, and bang it out. You get polynomials, you get five polynomials in the fourth derivatives of the curvature. Uh, it, it's mixed, it, you know, it's mixed polyn you know, it's, it's, it's enormous polynomials. They have 500 terms or something like that. They're, they're truly enormous, complicated things. I, I confess I used maple. I didn't write them out by hand. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, I just stared at it, and if I didn't know that there were any solutions, that there were non-constant curvature solutions, I would have just given up at that point. But, uh, but uh, Nerovsky and Ahn had, uh, had shown that these things actually existed, and, uh, and so I was intrigued by the problem, so I started studying it from the point of view of, uh, of you know, it, it's an overdetermined system of PDE on the pair of surfaces. You want to know how many solutions there are. And, uh, and I have not been able to completely solve it, but I have been able to finally show uh, this is that uh, this is last year. Uh, I've been able to show that if uh, f is zero, then uh, then either k1 or k2 is constant, must be constant. So that immediately wipes out one, uh, you know, half of the, so that now I have only 250 terms to deal with. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah. Now, and, but those 250 terms actually have a fairly nice structure to them. Uh, what they say is that all the fourth covariant derivatives of the curvature are, of the Gauss curvature of the other guy, are written as some r huge rational functions of the lower order derivatives. So in fact, if there's a solution, the solution is completely determined by the four jet, but by the three jet of the curvature at a point. If there are any solutions other than the other than these, right? And uh, and I've managed to go a little further. You that there are some restrictions on the third derivatives, but uh, but so far it's uh, you know I, I'm looking for a new idea because the 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 frontal assault has not uh, has not. Uh, yielded success at the moment. At least, you know, getting, the, getting one of the curvatures to be constant, I, I, I felt like I was halfway there. Uh, but, uh, but there's still, uh, still a lot of work to do. I, I, what's going to happen, of course, is that one of the, uh, you know, you know if, I can, if I can actually solve it, I'll actually be able to recover theirs. But I'm curious now to see whether or not there's anything else. I mean, because we're not assuming any rotational symmetry or anything like that. And that's the and that's the, the rub. Um, I'm sorry to, to leave you in such, a, uh, such an exhausted and ignorant state, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I thought you might enjoy seeing something about how this uh, uh, exceptional geometry shows up even in the simplest mechanical systems that you can, you can imagine, and, uh, and a little bit about where it leads. Uh, what's really exciting is where this stuff is going, I think. Uh, but understanding the simple examples is uh, is still a challenge, and uh, and I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping that we'll have some success with that before it's over with. Anyway, thanks for listening. So, <laughs> thank In these uh, simplest examples, uh, say. Uh, one sphere rolling on another. Is there a direct way of, un of understanding what this conformal structure is, rather than just? Uh... Yeah, yeah. You can you can write it down fairly easily. It's the basically uh, basically there's a uh, you know the the uh, one positive direction is when the is when the spheres twist this way, and the other is the matching of the surfaces. Basically, you take you take that guy and subtract off the dot product of the two, those two tangent planes, and that gives you the, sig the metric of signature uh, uh, one, well, three, two, yeah. But in, in these more complicated examples, when you're rolling one surface over another, is, is, it, is it 
Uh, that that description of the of the of the conformal structure is that works for all of them, right? Uh, that works for all of them. But then when you start differentiating to actually get to the to get to the to the vial curvature, you have some have something to do there. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Other questions? So, so Robert. Uh, uh, so at the very beginning of the ball rolling, the belt ball rolling mm -hmm. plane. Right. No sliding and no spinning means you can just draw the curve on the plane, and there's right. one way to roll it. That's right. There's only one way to roll it. That's right. And so that's what I was saying earlier. It's the problem of trying to navigate in five dimensions when you can only steer in two. Uh, you know. Uh, you know. Parallel parking, for example, is trying to navigate in three dimensions when you can only steer in two. But this is navigating in five dimensions. And it's commensurately harder. As a metric problem, you know, if you if you look at the at the you know at these things as metric spaces, that is, if you put a, a met you know a met uh, a inner product on D so that you can talk about length of curves and then define the distance between two points as the infimum of the distance, then it turns out that if I remember correctly, it turns out that the metric dimension, the Hausdorff dimension of the space is nine, because you get, because you get, uh, you have to count the dimensions oh, that you of the of the five-dimensional space, but with that metric, it's uh, it's the Hausdorff dimension. I mean, it's topologically five-dimensional, but it's Hausdorff dimension is nine. In the, you know, that's because the that's because the unit balls are very you know they collapse very very quickly in in the directions perpendicular to D, right? And so it takes a lot more of them to fill up a given volume. And so uh, so actually, you know the so you know parallel parking is the reason in some sense the reason it's difficult is that even though metrically even though topologically it's only a three dimensional configuration space of you know where the car is and how it's oriented. Uh, Metrically, it's four-dimensional because you have to count the transverse direction as two dimensions because you're having to control it by, by two, direct, two transverse directions tangent to D. And so that's why it's more, you know, that's one reason you could say that it's harder than it looks. Uh, and, uh, but, the, but when you look at the ball rolling on the plane, when you add up the, the metric dimensions, it's nine, which is another reason it's harder to... You know, it's it's harder to control something when you're controlling it like that. Yes. What if you don't allow the surfaces to pass through each other? So, like in your picture, <coughs> the saddle well is so deep it just couldn't get in. Okay. Yeah. So in that case, uh, well, if you can't get into the in, into the saddle, then you have to cut those possible configurations out. So you'd be looking at some open subset or possibly a set with a boundary because it can get wedged somewhere. I mean, you, you know, you, it's, a, it's a subset of this bundle, the set of physically realizable things if you want, but it's still a, it's still a, a, you know, a five manifold, basically, that you're trying to navigate in. Yeah. Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker again.